good welcome members and guests. I'm Hanny Michael, president of the Virtual Investment Club of Sacramento. Uh, we're a better investing model club open to the public. All of our meetings and stock studies are virtual, allowing us to have members from the US and around the world, including Canada and China. Uh, guests, uh, as a preservers, you're going to be uh, muted during the meeting, but we'll have an opportunity for questions and comments once the meeting ends. Any companies that we present uh, today are for educational purposes only and are not intended to be a recommendation for buying or selling any stocks. We ask that you co uh, conduct your own review and analysis of any company of interest before making an investment decision. Also, this meeting may mention products or services not endorsed by Better Investing or our club, and the views expressed are those of members and do not necessarily represent those of Better Investing. We will be recording this meeting uh, and we'll be uh, posting it to our YouTube channel for further use. Thank you. Joanne, could you please, um, or is Matt, uh, is Matt on? I'm here. Matt, do you want to go through the agenda? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're going to go to the treasurer's report next. Uh, spend 10 minutes on that. Um, okay. And I should mention, uh, word, uh, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, or you, uh, I just wanted to mention that we are going to to make sure that we stick to uh, the times allotted for each of the presentations. And so Joanne will be acting as timekeeper and is going to uh, give a warning and then uh, we'll be cutting people off if they go over. So, sorry, Matt. Great. Okay, uh, so 10 minutes on the Treasurer's report. Uh, Ten minutes just reviewing quickly the stock watchers reorganization I sent out, which I think satisfies all the rules. Um, Thirty minutes on an education topic for my iClub. Uh, then we're going to spend sixty, uh, if we need it, for the four um, quarterly reports. Uh, only one of which had any action on it, which was Joanne's, and then twenty minutes. Uh, to discuss any buying and selling. So with that, the treasurer's report. Okay, uh, do you want to give me the screen? Yeah. Can everybody see that? I yep. can, yes. Okay, um, <clears throat> this is, um, I guess, uh, these, these are our holdings, and this is the gain and, and loss since the time of purchase. Um, just uh, to review here a little bit, uh, the recent purchases, BJ's is up 17% since we bought it. Uh, last month, Canadian Solar is down 19% since we bought it, um, and Domino's is up 10%. So I guess the restaurants are doing well and the solar business is in trouble. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions about uh, this part of the report here. Um, let's see, uh, valuation statement. Um, this shows, uh, you know, the percentages that we have in each uh, each of the stock. I guess looks like Disney is our largest holding at 10%. And um, we have uh, almost $5,000 in cash. I added $1,000 in cash just before the meeting. Um, as far as, uh, well, I guess that shows what the uh, percentages this is a, a graphical or a chart uh, of, uh, of, 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 what, of what we have. It's, I don't know, this, to me it's almost easier to see the chart 
to this because there's so so many holdings here. Um, let's see what what else. Um, oh, sector industry diversification. Um, we've got uh, you know the. I think there's a I think there's a chart at the bottom of that page too. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess uh, most of them are what they call economically uh, sensitive, and then some are cyclical, some are defensive. Um, and then we've got you know technology and is our biggest holding, followed by uh, communications, then industrials, um, and then this shows. Uh, I guess we keep breaking it down a little. A little further, uh, their te technology. I guess the colors are the same, but this sort of uh, specifies which uh, industries these uh, companies are in. I guess that's sectors and then, above. Yeah. And then down here is the companies that are represented uh, in each of these uh, particular uh, industries. Tom, if I could make just a quick comment while sure. we're on this. So when when um, when we come to do stock studies, it's uh, important to um, t for for people doing the stock study to look at look at this chart, go into my iClub, and then um, see which areas. If you look at the bottom there, it says sectors not represented, basic materials. So that's like mining and so on. Consumer defensive, healthcare, and energy. So, um, you know, we we should be trying to, as much as possible, uh, have a um, something, some stocks from those sectors. So, when you come to um, do a stock study, just take a look at the uh, at this and see what we're missing and what we're overweight in. We we have a lot of um, technology, so we we wouldn't be picking any more technology companies. Uh, but maybe trying to boost up some of the the other sectors, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the education topic. But there's another one, Tom. If if you go up to the reports tab there on the left hand side, um, the if you go to the one under portfolio, it says uh, EPS growth rate diversification on the left. No, on the on the left bar, there's yeah. Uh, no, just yeah, down there. EPS uh, under portfolio. This is EPS growth. Oh, okay. Rate. Sorry. Yeah, I I was looking at the a different at the left, but that's fine. So what this um, I'll talk about this one as well. But you could you could see that um, we have a number of companies that are growing at less than seven percent. Uh, per annum. In fact, air lease is projected to. I'm not sure if I agree with these numbers because I looked, for example, at air lease on another website and it had a different EPS projection yeah. about. Yeah. Are, are these are these uh, BI derived numbers like what would pop up on the SSGs? I'm not sure. I've been trying to figure out where they get those EPS growth rates from, but um, I guess the first section is less than 7%. These would be uh, maybe, you know, larger companies that um, that are that are going to be slow growers. Okay. And then, okay, now I, I just, you know, when you pull up, I pull up my SSG for LAM research here, showing analyst consensus 6.8 for the long term, and this chart is showing 6.8 for the long term. So I think that's mm -hmm. where the number comes from. Okay. okay, but air lease wouldn't be negative 28, would it? I don't, that that doesn't. Let me I, have a quick look. I looked on, um, I think it was Zacks or Yahoo Finance, and it was around 10%. But well, maybe, those, yeah. those estimates vary so much. Yeah, yeah. Five minutes. <clears throat> okay, um, so, uh, okay, that is uh, definitely... Um, <clears throat> Good, Air lease uh, good. is incorrect. Air lease, the sales uh, two-year estimate is 21.5 percent. So I don't know why this negative 20. I don't know where that came from. Huh. I just looked up at the SSG. 
So is, is that's not what we projected. That's what BI is projecting to 21% EPS growth rate? Yeah, analyst consensus estimates. Whoa. Uh, two year. I don't know what, who, which analysts are we talking, but that's what. Uh, wow. To me, there's no long term. Yeah. To me, that doesn't sound realistic, but uh, okay. No. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is uh, interesting no. information here. Um, I don't know. Is there anything else that somebody wants to look at? I, you know, I have to admit I'm uh, new at this and don't uh, really um, don't have much um, experience. Tom, can yeah. I say something? Sure. That air lease um, has an asterisk by it, and there's a couple for those uh, projected EPS growth rates. There's several stocks that have asterisks near them, so. The consensus of five-year anniversary rate as projected. Yeah. Oh, okay. So for air lease, they don't have a long term, five years. It's a dash. As right now I'm looking at. I don't know where they get the negative from. I just refreshed the data. It says trailing twelve month growth trends. There's an algorithm they use based on historical annual, quarterly, and trailing twelve month growth trends. Mm. So they're calculate. They have an algorithm. They're calculating it mm. themselves. Okay. If there's no analyst estimates. Okay. So I I take those ones with an asterisk, uh, with a grain of salt. Yeah. Um. The solar, the Canadian solar, what that company is not the energy company. It's considered a tech company. And what about AQN? Because I look at the energy right now, we, it's not in our... AQN, AQN is, is a utility. 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 What about CSIQ? CSIQ. Well, Which one is well, that? The, 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 uh, Canadian Canadian solar. Canadian solar. They sell the equipment for, for, for solar, water. which is electronics. Oh, because I, yeah, I look to... No, that's energy. They don't sell power. CSIQ energy. Yes, they do. Well, they make power with their panels. So, right. So in the report that Tom mentioned, that we don't have energy right now. So that's I'm just curious. I thought we just presented the energy in a. But I think not. energy refers primarily to oil and gas and. Oh, uh, okay. That sort of thing. So. I see. I think okay. these guys, yeah, because they sell solar panels, so they're not okay. really. They must okay. be industrial yeah. or something. Okay. And what does uh, sensitive mean again? Sensitive sectors? Sens sensitive means that it's sensitive to the economy, Con whereas like consumer defensive uh, is like food, for example. It depend regardless of what, how the economy is doing, people are going to buy food. So mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not sensitive to economic cycles. Um, but uh, something like mining, if you're making copper, um, that's sensitive to economic cycles. If there's a strong housing growth, people use copper for pipes and that sort of thing, wiring. Um, so it, it goes up and down with the economy. One minute. Okay. Thanks. Okay, well, I'm, I'm done unless anybody has any, any questions. Okay, it's Matt's. Uh... Topic. Do, I need, do I need to give it to Matt, or how does that work? Oh, I can work? do that. Let me help handle it. Okay. Okay. All right. So just real quick, hope everybody can see this. Um, I took a stab at just, uh, I guess, just setting this up first. Uh, it's been a while since we reorganized um, the stock watchers, and I think we're supposed to do it once per year, if I remember right. Twice. Somebody... You mean rotation? Yeah. You mean rotation? I think we decided it twice a year. Uh, we rotate every two years. Because that's one year. Because oh, the annual report years. only comes once a year. So, yeah, two years and then we rotate. Um, okay. I, well, some of I these have been like a year and a half. So, what's that? Oh, I just want to make a comment about I presented AQN. So, just mm -hmm. kind of avoid the bias. I, I shouldn't follow AQN. Okay. okay can you I guess what was you, Matt? Um, can you and I trade? Because I've already followed five. Oh, I presented five too. Yeah. I was. Yeah. Well, just because you present, so I mean, we're it's put Jay here. 
Well, we've held it for a while, right? Uh, Joanne, yeah. Yeah, sure. I was I would prefer to follow CSIQ because I want to. Because oh, you, don't like, that you don't like the management. <laughs> yes, I just try to. You don't? Know? Oh, it's full of the management. Yes, I hear you. I want you to follow it then. So okay. then, so um, then. I follow five. I can do you five then. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. There you go. Perfect. You know, that CSIQ, okay. that's a real interesting one. With PE, like four or five. I've never seen a stock like that. I, I, I don't know. But uh, I noticed a very low PE on CSIQ. Mm, Unusual low. It sounds interesting. Mm. Uh, Matt, can you make uh, no, put sure. my make my A capital? Oh yeah, join A is a cap, cap, yeah. uppercase. A, only capital A. a. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like MacBook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Okay. And then, so I guess just run through it real quick. Bernard, you'd stick. So starting January 1st, I guess that's kind of the mm. cutoff I made because that was going to be our next yeah. meeting. Okay. Uh, we would go, Bernard would stick with Comcast. Annie, you would do Disney and IPGP. I don't know if you presented either one of those. No. Initially. No. Okay. Um, then public storage, if we keep it, we'll go to Jane. Uh, which that can always change, I guess. Yes. Uh, and then tonight. AQN to Joanne. Mm. Uh, Fleet Core to Jay. I, I think would take I five. You presented them all, Jay. No, I think that <laughs> one was Haney. Haney presented you the follow. Fleet Core. Never mind. Haney presented <laughs> Fleet Core. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I do five. Heko would go to Joanne. Uh, John D and John C would keep Air Lease and Schwab since they just started this year. Uh, I would do BJ's restaurants. Um, Jay, you do Canadian Solar, like we just said. Uh, mm -hmm. Facebook to Megumi, because I know she loves Facebook so much. I don't even have Facebook. Um, I've never been on Facebook. I don't know anything <laughs> about it, but I'll do it. <laughs> oh, okay. perfect. Perfect for you. <laughs> Uh, Domino's Pizza to Mina, uh, Skyworks to Tom, and then he would also keep uh, Lamb Research as well. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I know that Mina eats a lot of pizza, so that's appropriate. <laughs> Wait, do you guys have a Domino Pizza in Canada? <laughs> yes, we do. Oh. But we have something bigger called Pizza Pizza, but it's a bigger chain than Domino's. But Domino's is catching up. Hmm. Okay. Well, great. Well, that's it. That's all I wanted to, and we just had a chance to get it all out. So, okay. I'll update everything with this and then hopefully we'll get us on the same, you know, everybody on the same schedule kind of too. And then okay. it'll be easier Thanks to change for doing that, everything. Matt. Okay, now, doing are, good, good yeah, job. sure. Are we having a December meeting? I can't come, Tom. So if we're stock study, I can't come to that one. Not stock study. It's just education topic. Well, it's he, Matt has stock study on here. Oh, really? Oh, oh well, I think oh, I came in January. January. It said January, January yeah. before. January. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, so that would say January. Sorry. Okay. Uh, and the meeting would be in the first yeah. week of, the first Monday of December, correct? No. Oh, yeah. first, not the, not oh, the third, not the yeah. third. It's just a oh. education topic. Oh, okay, I can, yeah, I can do that. I thought it was going to be the third. No. Well, regular, education no. and maybe if we're, if some of the studies were handed in late that we Oh, yeah, we could do at. that. I thought yeah. you were going to say, or a party. And that too. <laughs> you could have an online, online party. Yeah, right yeah, yeah I want to see how online parties go. I haven't tried that before, but yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, now now this this uh, this is showing these reports are going to be presented in December. This page yeah. here in oh. front of me. Oh, it's yeah. a gender typo. So we're going to have a, we're going to have a education topic and some stocks. Oh, there's a, a lot Wait, of them. Are you sure? Oh, we are. Well, I think it would we be don't do Q4. We don't do Q4. Actually, Q4 and the and the annual report presented all together from the company. Right? Yeah. Actually, Tom, I asked you that question. So okay. why do we not do in Q4? Do you remember? I said. And um, 
because the company filed in Q4, the annual report, it seems almost like... It's the same. Yeah. Same. So we don't same. do Q4. It, we call it annual report. Yeah, we call it annual. Is that what you mean, annual report? Or do you mean Q4, um, uh, Matt? Same thing, same thing. He, he mean, I'll, you know, I'm going to correct it. Okay. Oh, okay. For Disney, I'm not sure. In Skyworks, I think it, that's just what was on here. I forget where I got Q4. It's exactly. annual. Okay, we don't so do Q4. So, okay. Yeah. So are, are we having a... A, a December meeting? I don't think we present. I think you, he meant January. I have a feeling. Who? Oh, he's he's asking a different Matt. question. I, I, <laughs> I know there was an email that went out about you know Hanny, Hanny proposed we have a December meeting. Oh yeah, that's just a yeah. topic. I think, I think that we've decided on that or not. So if we're going to have oh. a December meeting, we need to know how to prepare. Yeah. So maybe yeah, should... I thought the point was to do all the stock reports that came in late because oh, so like to still uh -huh. do them. Mm. Yeah, so I did mean we December. Could. Yeah, I like that. The I, I want to get. I don't want these to go too pa long past too their yeah. mm -hmm. their okay, earnings I, call. I I can do Skyworks, but I think it's going to be Skyworks is on a funny uh, fiscal year, and I I think oh I don't know about. I, I'm pardon me. Lamb Lamb Research is. I don't know oh. about Skyworks. Well, okay. Just to clarify. Okay, four minutes. Um, we were there was two reasons why we should have a December meeting. And first of all, we wanted to do it, or I suggested we do it in the first week because if we do it on the third week of December, that's too close to Christmas. So. The reason for doing it was because we don't have enough education topics during the year, and as a model club, we need to do more education topics. And the second reason is that we've had a f some of the uh, reports that were supposed to be presented today came in late. We agreed last week that we have to submit our, our um, quarterly and annual reports a week in advance so that people have time to review them. So I think what we could do next if we have a December meeting, is do a, a quick education topic and just the reports that were submitted late. And then we continue on with our regular schedule of reports in January. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yes. Can we do it on December 9th? Yeah. We can do it on any day as long as people are willing to... Uh, Oh, you mean second week of December, not the first week of December? We could do that too. I think, yeah, I think not any difference. Yeah, two weeks before, three weeks before Christmas should be fine, I suppose. Yeah, that works for me. It might be a bit too close uh, to this meeting. So well, that makes but they've sense. already right. but they've already done their stock studies. You just turned them in late. True, but we have okay. to. Somebody has to do an education topic too, so oh, well. that might be okay. Anyway, okay. 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 So, is any objections to that? No. To what date? To the ninth. Well, okay. a, any objections no. to having a meeting in December and to the ninth as the date if we have it? No objection. No, no okay. objections. Yeah, it's yeah, okay with me. Okay All right. with me. Okay. One minute. All right. We're done, I think. Okay. Yeah. Educa okay. okay. Education yeah. topic. Okay. okay, Jay, if you yeah. give me yeah. the... Uh, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Show my screen. Okay. So, wait. The So, the, the updated stock study starts January, right? 2020? Is that for next year? The new ones, yes. Yeah, that new, okay. It's next new, year. Okay. Yeah, All right. Ones. Thank okay. you. So um, I will try to do this in 30 minutes. I have about uh, 14 or 15 slides. Um, so this is a bit of a reminder. Uh, it's not a really a new education topic, but it's a bit of a reminder about our investment, let's call it policy statement, um, which is really what you know the uh, approach that we take um, and how we do things. So I'll just uh, go through. So the um, first of all, what is a investment policy statement? It, it's really used. It's a describes a process to be used by a club or by anyone in making investment decisions. So if you know, for each of us, if we have our own investment portfolio, we should actually 
put together an IPS, Investment Policy Statement. So it covers basically five areas, things like goals. So I wanna save so much money every month. Um, if, and I wanna have maybe a certain amount of money when I retire, uh, those types of goals. Um, and then how do I reach those goals? So there, there's different investment vehicles that uh, are going to help me reach those goals. Those vehicles have a risk and return profile. Um, so if I have more aggressive goals, say I wanna make 20% return per year, then I might have to take on more risky and volatile investments that might go up and down, fluctuate quite a bit. Then um, how will I monitor the results? So every year, every quarter. So in our club, um, as far as risk and return, we use the upside downside ratio and we monitor uh, our, our portfolio uh, quarterly. Um, and we have a treasurer's report every month that monitors the results as well. And then based on, on those results, we can adjust our portfolio accordingly. So that's, that's the process in kind of a, a simple terms. Um, for some reason, my, my slides aren't, oh, here we go. Okay, sorry. Uh, so why do we have a, what's the purpose of this uh, policy statement, investment policy. Well, it, it, it enforces consistency so that if everyone understands what our objectives are, then when we come to make decisions, we're uh, making decisions on a consistent basis. We're not deviating and coming up with sort of random approaches, but we have a framework and we, we make the decisions within that framework. Uh, it prevents us from getting, uh, looking at investments that are not suitable for the club. So for example, um, I don't know, maybe we don't wanna invest internationally, so, or we don't invest in mutual funds, we just invest in stocks. So uh, once you describe what, what the um, objectives are and, and the vehicles, that statement then again helps us to, if someone comes and says, well, we want we wanna invest in, uh, in real estate, well, we don't, we don't do that. So it, again, it's it's just provides clarity and consistency. And then because we're taking a disciplined approach, it helps our members be more proficient and successful investors. And if we follow this at a, on a personal level as well, um, we'll we'll have the same benefits. And then finally, as a as a model club um, where we have guests. Uh, it, helps new members and guests by clearly showing uh, what we do, how we do it, and, and why we do it. So uh, what are our goals and objectives? And these are things I just took from um, various documents that we had. So we, we are long-term investors. We have a portfolio invested in quality growth companies. And uh, our objective is to have a total return of 15% compounded annually. And that includes both price appreciation and dividends, uh, if we have dividend uh, stocks. Uh, so the combination of, of price going up and the dividends being reinvested should uh, return 15%. This will allow the portfolio to double every five years. Now, a lot of clubs in better investing talk about 15% compounded annually. And I think that that's a bit of a, uh, a misnomer and a more realistic objective is to really try to beat the market by 5%. But if you look at long-term uh, market returns, they're about 10%, somewhere around there, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So people sort of, uh, uh, you know, settled on this 15%. Uh, but really, if, if the market is really bad uh, for a period of time, uh, then, you know, looking at just 5% makes more sense because you may not find uh, investments that will uh, give you a 15% return. And conversely, if the market is doing really well, as we had in the last 10 years or so, uh, 15 may be too low. So um, it's, it really should be relative to the market, uh, trying to beat the market by 
which means we need to know what the market is doing each year um, so that we can set that goal. So our investment approach, and this is what we've been following, is to invest a set amount regularly, $1,000 per month. <clears throat> we invest in quality growth stocks, ETFs, and we haven't invested in ETFs or mutual funds, but that's um, something that we could do. We diversify the portfolio by looking at different sectors, different um, industries and so on, different size companies. And where, wherever, when possible, we want to be fully invested, meaning we don't want to have a lot of cash sitting around. Now, I say when possible because it's, it's very easy to panic when we have a lot of cash, like last month, and we may make some decisions without really studying companies properly or um, just feeling pressure to invest that cash. And if you look at uh, somebody like Warren Buffett, for example, and Berkshire Hathaway, they literally have something like, um, I can't remember the number, but billions of dollars in cash sitting around. And they haven't found anything worthwhile to invest in that, that um, aligns with their investment principles. So they're just staying in cash. And there's nothing wrong with that. You'd like to be fully invested, but only if it makes sense. And finally, um, we take all of the earnings and dividends and any profits and so on, and we reinvest those. We don't, we don't um, take them out of the portfolio. And so all of these things, uh, these approaches can apply to our personal portfolios as well. Now, I just wanted to, um, so we talk about, because we, um, we invest as a club, um, thousand dollars a month a lot of people say well that's you know that's a lot of money and it is uh, that's twelve thousand dollars a year uh, I can't possibly do that on, on a personal level so I just wanted to illustrate this a little bit so um, I go to Starbucks every once in a while because I own Starbucks uh, stock as well and I buy a grande coffee and it's a, in Canada it's two dollars and sixty nine cents I think it's in the same um, so if um, if I do that every every day, which is a bit excessive, but let's just say that I did that every day, that's about nineteen dollars a week, eighteen eighty three, and that's about nine hundred and eighty eight dollars a year. <clears throat> and if um, if I can invest that um, at twelve percent um, annually, compounded annually, and I I left it to for twenty years, and I did that every day, I uh, take my the money that I was going to spend on a Starbucks and put it in my bank account and uh, once a month or something and buy some stock with it. Now, by the way, um, you might say, well, you know, uh, who drinks one cup of coffee every day from Starbucks? Well, there's a lot, actually a lot of people do, but um, that that one coffee a day is equivalent to three uh, grande cinnamon dolce lattes at five dollars and forty four cents. So if you if you drink three lattes a week, that's equivalent to drinking seven cups of coffee, uh, you know, a week, which is again um, a lot of people do that. So what is the total value of this investment uh, after twenty years? Well, it's seventy five thousand dollars, and uh, fifty five thousand of that is interest, and you can go and work this out. Um, there's a website, which I put a link to. It's uh, getsmartaboutmoney.ca. It's a Canadian website, but the math is the same. The calculator works the same. And it's a compound interest calculator. You can put in, you know, change any of these variables. So um, one other point that I wanted to highlight, so it's pretty significant, right? 20, but, you know, uh, it's 20 years. Now, we have a few people in the club and um, as guests who are young investors. So they have a little bit of a different time horizon that I, than I do, um, given my age, which I won't tell you what my age is, but just uh, pretend. So what if I um, was, uh, say, Mina or somebody like that, and uh, I could do this for 40 years? How much money would I have? Same, same thing, but all I've changed is, is the number of years to grow this investment. Anybody want to take a guess? One million. 800,000, very close. And um, 
the interest earned on that is $762,000. So that's not insignificant. Now, let me give you just one more example, because again, somebody might say, well, you know, that's great, but I don't have a lot of money to invest or what have you. Where can I find some money? Well, so this is a study. Oops, I, I got to the punchline too quickly. Um, so this is, um, I, I mixed these up. This shouldn't have popped up, but um, this was a big study done by uh, the Two Degree Institute. Um, they compared buying an electric vehicle versus equivalent uh, ICE vehicle, internal combustion engine. So you could buy a Volkswagen Golf hatchback or you could buy the e-golf. And um, the savings on an annual basis, if you buy the electric vehicle, is about $2,500. And if you want to look at the study, it goes into gory detail. It includes uh, price of gas. It includes um, uh, maintenance costs, re federal rebates on, on electric vehicles, and so on and so forth. So they did two cars. They did the Kia Soul and uh, the Volkswagen um, Golf. And if you took that savings of 2,500 and invested it for 40 years, you'd get uh, almost $2 million. And so between the coffee and the um, buying an electric vehicle and, and taking the savings and investing it, uh, in 40 years time, you could have $3 million, which is pretty s significant amount, obviously. So um, there are a lot of other ways that you know, you can cut costs and save save on things. And if that money is invested at, at 12%, um, and our goal was 15, so I didn't go too aggressive here, um, it can it can add up over time. So just a quick uh, example. So risk management, that was the, uh, the third part of the process is, is how do we do, uh, minimize risk? Well, it's... Um, uh, by having a diversified portfolio. So we, we buy stocks with a margin of safety uh, that have a upside downside ratio between 10 and three. Uh, and I pick 10 here because if you go above 10, then usually there's something wrong in the numbers. So 10 is just kind of the upper limit. Uh, we look at buying stocks with a total return, again, dividends and price appreciation of about greater than 15%. Uh, sell only when uh, the uh, total return of the portfolio or the um, individual stock starts to deteriorate. And that's why we do these quarterly reports. We're looking to see, is this stock going to give us uh, a future return that, that's in line with our objective? And that's why we, we review these things on a regular basis. And uh, make sure that when we add to the portfolio or, or subtract from it, that that's going to have a positive impact on the total uh, portfolio return and and the risk profile. So again, um, you know, we shouldn't look at our portfolio in isolation. We'll have some stocks that go up, some will go down, but overall we're looking for that 15% or 5% above market. And um, um, you know, we're we're making decisions to add and subtract companies and replace companies. Uh, based on how they might um, impact the, the portfolio. And then we only buy after we do a rigorous stock study. And in SSG, we research the company, we research the industry. And those are really important. Um, and we, we have been getting away from doing these things recently um, in the last few months. So I just wanted to, you know, to highlight that when we do uh, further stock studies that we need to do the the industry research um, research the company don't just do the SSG because SSG is just a bunch of numbers you really need to understand what their business is what is it that they're selling how do they get more customers how do they grow their sales and then the customers um, or sorry the um, the sales growth um, you know, can you can look at that and see if it makes sense or not. Let me give you a quick example. We, I think, was it Ulta Beauty? That um, it was either Ulta Beauty or Five. So both those businesses, I think it was Five, which was um, they have these stores with uh, 
everything at five dollars or less and it's aimed at teens and uh, specifically girls um, yeah so if if we you know if you look at that and you say well I think um, you know they're gonna grow at a, a rate of 10 percent per year well if you go and start researching the company a little bit you'll find in their 10 K uh, management will talk about how many stores they want to open next year let's say and they also talk about how much money how much revenue they make from one store so one can easily do a quick calculation and say okay if they're planning on opening a hundred stores and they make a thousand dollars per store that's you know um, uh, ten thousand uh, dollars so it doesn't take like a lot of you know research to identify or to figure out if, if the, the sales growth um, makes sense or not but it, it needs you know needs uh, one to look at the business and how the business operates and how they make money so doing this research not just the SSG but reading the 10k reading the management discussion um, and analysis and trying to understand how they make money and what where their costs are and so on is, is, is critical um, and again, uh, sorry, going back here, doing the, the research, industry research. Um, so we want to buy the best companies in each industry, the top companies. And there's no way to figure that out without doing some sort of research about that industry. So, uh, for example, if, if we're looking at, say, you know, grocery stores, Grocery stores work based on volume. They make very little profit. They make maybe 3% profit, but they sell a lot. Um, so if we're, if we're comparing two grocery stores and one is making 5% and the other is making three, um, you know, they're, they're, the one making five is doing much better than the average for the industry, which is, which is three. So we need to understand what, what's possible in that industry what the limitations are and, and the competitors to, to make sure that we're buying the best companies. And so, again, I think I've seen a lot of SSGs in, in better investing where people just get a comfort level because they plugged in these numbers and they get an upside downside ratio of, you know, three or more and they say, okay, this is a buy. But there's probably, a, you know, I can probably pull out some examples of, uh, buys that have not worked out very well and and that's because um, you know maybe we didn't dig enough into the company to, to understand their business and how they are positioned within their industry so doing that research I think is, is critical uh, as far as diversification goes again um, we are looking at 25% that are of companies that we own in our portfolio should be fast growers 50% medium and 25% slower growers. So at Disney, for example, uh, might not grow as fast as, you know, um, Canadian solar, you know, just as an example. Um, if it does, if it grows more, that's great. But by having that, um, that balance between the fast growers, the smaller companies and the, the, the larger uh, companies, um, you can look at the portfolio as a whole and make sure that it's growing at, at, the, at the right, uh, giving us the right total return. Um, the other one is not having more than 30% in any one sector, and that's, again, to reduce risk and, and um, not be overweight in a particular sector if that sector uh, suffers uh, some sort of economic um, uh, loss so for example um, if you look at the tech sector a lot of the companies were investing in China then we had the the political fallout with China and uh, a lot of those companies were impacted so by not being too exposed uh, to one sector we can uh, min minimize the effects of those types of um, uh, of, of negative uh, situations uh, no more than 15% industry along the same lines. And then uh, <clears throat> no sector smaller than 10% because uh, if you want to understand the industry and the sector um, and you need to do that research, again, uh, you know, it could spend a lot of effort trying to understand something and, 
but it's it's a very small part of the portfolio, so it doesn't the results don't really impact the overall numbers. And the same for any individual holding. It should be at least three percent for the same reason. If I if we have one percent of a company, um, even if it does really well, it's not going to make much difference to the portfolio. So one um, uh, calculation we can do to figure out the the maximum uh, holding for a company is two times the equal share percent. So if we have 15 stocks and they're all equal, then each one is one fifteenth, which is about seven percent, and two times that would be 14 percent. So um, the maximum that we should hold. Uh, for any one company would be 14%. If we own 10 stocks, uh, it would be one tenth, uh, and two times that uh, would be 20%. So it depends on the number of stocks that that uh, we own. And again, we don't want to hold a lot of cash uh, for an extended period of time, and I talked about that already. So <clears throat> going back. Um, to the SSG. So when we do a stock study, we look at tangible factors. Those are historical sales and EPS, profitability, uh, how's management doing, stability of the EPS growth, and so on, um, financial strength, all of these things. So these are all sort of numerical and they can be calculated. Some intangible factors are quality of management in industry characteristics and then competitive positions. And these are things that you'd really need to go and do a little bit of research and digging, uh, both in the 10K and to read about um, you know, the, that particular industry and to find out how, um, you know, what, what's normal and, and um, what's normal operating practice, what are normal results in that industry, and then compare the tangible factors that we get to uh, these industry metrics. And by, by doing that, that's why we do industry studies, is to get a better sense of um, you know, how do these companies perform within their industry. Are they industry leaders or are they industry laggards? Uh, again, this, a lot of this is pretty sort of motherhood, but doing it consistently is difficult. And so just by reviewing it today, uh, hopefully we can, you know, get back and, and be more diligent when we do our studies because our track record has been really good. And I think if we continue to do what we were doing in the past, um, we'll continue to see some pretty good uh, returns. Uh, so this was just something that I, uh, that report that Tom showed earlier, I just wanted to show the EPS growth rate diversification. So looking at uh, you know the the average of of these guys um, and I again I just added these numbers up but I think there's a few errors it looks like with these stars so um, but again all, all I'm trying to show here is that we have these groupings of companies that are growing at different rates and the overall portfolio needs to um, you know grow at a rate that 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 uh, um, is consistent with with what we're trying to achieve. Um, so if we were to take the these growth rates and multiply the mu multiply them by the market value uh, over a five say a five year period and then calculate the the total, that'll tell us how much um, our portfolio is growing. So if if these numbers are correct. I didn't do that calculation, but we could easily do it. Then we could figure out, are we going to reach our objective or not? So when maybe when we're doing, you know, uh, portfolio reports, we could look at some of these things. Mm -hmm. um, this is just sector diversification, which Tom showed earlier. So we were heavily weighted in technology and communication. And uh, by company, Disney, 10%, Facebook, 7%. Um, 10% cash. Um, so, but you know, overall, I think we're pretty good. We've got a couple here like Schwab and Airlease, that, or sorry, PSA, that are that are only 2%, and uh, BJ is 2.3. So these are are kind of small. Uh, if they have good 
uh, returns, they're not going to impact the overall portfolio. So we should look at maybe adding to these positions uh, because they're pretty small at the moment. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah, how do you define long term? You said we're long term investors. So we're we're not like traders, um, yeah. you know. You, so you you can you can hold, you know. It'd be interesting to see. The club has only been around since 2016, so, um, oh. you know. But usually, you don't want to hold. You you don't want to sell unless there's a good reason to sell. Then you just keep holding. And uh, so it could be five years, three years, five years. If the company's doing well and it's giving you this, you know, uh, the same return each each year, why would you sell it? So that's well, basically what long term is. Okay. So it's well. It seems like if it's we made a bunch of money, maybe that would be the time to sell so that we can find other companies to invest. It seems like we've been selling yeah. when everything's been down. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that's another another thing is if so say say uh, Apple is a good example. <clears throat> so I don't know what the market cap of Apple is. It's like a trillion dollars or close to it. Uh, same with Microsoft. And so those companies, it's going to be very difficult for Apple to double in size in five mm -hmm. years. Impossible. Um, so if if we owned Apple and we made money on it then it might be a good idea to sell it and look for a smaller company that can double in size in, in five years. Right. So that's, you know, that's a very good point. So, um, but we may have held Apple for 10 years and, you know, we bought it when it was really small and it, it, it grew over time and now it's kind of slowing down. Um, so it's a long-term investment, but it's just reached kind of its end of its growth cycle. Like yeah, me, that's why I, I was asking. So, oh, yeah. That's why I was asking about the when you say long term. That's all. Okay. When you, Megumi, when you say so, you know you noticed yeah. when Stian we sell, do you referring? Did, did you refer to the club portfolio, like in the yeah. last two meetings? Yeah. Yeah. That's why Henny is doing this education topic to reinforce the stock study because. We did a couple mistakes that we bought something was not in depth of a study, and mm -hmm. um, you know we felt that it was not a strong hold. That's why we. Well, like them. for example, I saw that the solar companies dropped twenty percent since the last mm. month. Like, did we mm. do something wrong, or what's the when you you know like how long are we going to hang on to that? Uh huh. Um, so you know, before we. That, that's that's why I the wanted... price drop, not, to, I, not necessarily the performance of the company. I, you have I, to wait and see. You have to I actually, okay, for that company, for last month, we had three stocks, three in different industries presentation. And there's another example that I raised um, concern to um, the team, to the executive team, that I don't feel like we did depth research. So we did not show the competitor. You say you studied, they studied the competitor. Probably you did study the competitor, but not in depth. Like how does competitor, I did not see any SSG of a competitors. So uh, well, I don't know what went wrong, but I raised question. That's why I want to follow that company. I'm interested in that industry, but I just feel like I, you know, that's just another example. I don't know what went wrong. So, it could be just a timing, but it yeah. could be also main way maybe did not study well. I don't know. So yeah. So I'm, like yeah. like with that drop, how do you know if it's a drop in fundamentals? How do you know? Yeah. It just seems drastic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It well, might be a bargain. It might be a disaster. We don't know. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I want to mention one point, if I could ever, but. Uh, I've been reading this book by Clunan, who started the American Association of Individual Investors. And he's got a book now, um, his latest book. And he's saying that volatility is a poor measure of risk. That real risk comes that you don't have the money you need when you need it. So that if you're planning to retire in five years, 
there would be a risk if you don't have enough money in five years. But but volatility is a very temporary thing, and it's, it's not a real good. You have to measure risk according to what you're what you need to purchase. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a good point, Bernard. And if um, you know, if you want to get more sort of information on that, there was uh, if you uh, if you listen to any of the manifest investing seminars, there was one done by Cy Lynch, and he talked about precisely that. And I think it's on YouTube, um, but it's a good point because you know volatility and price changes are really sort of uh, how people are reacting psychologically to certain conditions and um, it doesn't yeah. it doesn't necessarily reflect the value of the company and that's what you know Warren Buffett um, says in in his annual reports he said uh, you know what I can't remember the the exact quote but uh, buy when people are fearful and sell mm -hmm. when people are greedy right so yeah um, yeah so you know it's so you have to separate sort of price radical price movements, which is volatility, from the value of the company. And I think we do that. We try to yeah. do that through, you know, quarterly reports and and doing you know good research into the industry and the companies. Yeah, but that's a that's a very yeah. good point. Any other questions? So back to that drop in 20%. Oh, like, would... Don't worry about it. Maybe if we did our research and, no, you not. know. Uh, then we want yeah. to see that it was just that one, what went wrong? So what's the news? What, what caused, for example, we need to look that, um, what have the follower? Well, I decided today to follow that company, okay. right? So I need to look okay. into what made that, huge drop what went wrong and if it's something not saying they have a fraud let's say something very significant if it's a fraud anything then we need to sell right away if it just mm -hmm. because let's just say trade war or something uh, you know other than management then we may want to just wait a little bit longer than another maybe two quarters to see the trend give a chance really depends on what I was think the cause to have that drop? So I, I, I give you a simple and example. Sorry, go ahead, Bernard. Be good. Just one minute. I think it'd be this would be a good point also to do the industry comparison. That would help you really evaluate the CSIQ in in more full fuller picture. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead, Jane Haney. So that we, I was looking at a company and um, they were at like three dollars and then they went down within a month to one dollar, and um, I couldn't figure out why they had such a big drop. And I started reading their um, their annual report and they ha they had bought another company, smaller company. Um, they are small themselves, um, but this company that they bought had essentially uh, two or three customers, and that was it. And those customers accounted for like 90% of their revenue. And they um, they have these what's called master service agreements. So their customers say to them, you know, we we're going to give you a contract for the next five years to do all of our work. And um, uh, they had a disagreement with with one of their large customers, and uh, uh, the customer didn't like the quality, and so they stopped they stopped all the work that was going on until these guys could fix the the problem, and that's what caused the significant drop because they were so heavily reliant on just one client. Um, so, but I wouldn't have figured any of that out without reading their 10K. And, and I think you really have to sort of dig and uh, look at different information sources to see what's causing uh, these these price changes. And if it's not something significant, uh, then it might be a good idea to buy the stock when it goes down and then wait until it goes up. So. Well, would that be significant? That's 
it was a pretty significant drop. And the, the big risk is that they're relying on only three customers. Right. Uh, so, so they're not really diverse. So actually they're not, they're, they were in an engineering company. So imagine <laughs> as an architectural firm, right. right? And you, you only have two, two or three clients and, and, you know, one of them decides that they don't like you anymore for whatever reason. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, it happens so, a lot. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> So, you know, that's, that's, but you wouldn't know that without really digging in. So I think that's the main, the main point. Uh But, but that relationship is like, so it can be so volatile. You know what I mean? You can see that the company, if, if they only have, or is your point that if the company only has two clients, um, then, then that's a huge risk. Just don't even invest in it. And right. Yeah, exactly. So no matter, even if that came out. Yeah. yeah. Yes. If, if, they, if they had 10 or 15 clients and one of them decided that, you know, they didn't want to work with them anymore, that's fine because they're mm-hmm. diversified. So mm-hmm. in our, in our company, I'll tell you, like in our, in our, in the company that I work in, um, we deliberately have, we work in three market sectors. We work in mining and metals, in energy and in infrastructure and in energy, which is the area that I'm involved with. You know, we work for hydro water uh, clients, wind, solar, nuclear, uh, thermal, and we work for clients, you know, throughout the world. So we're not reliant on any particular, you know, client or in any particular geography. We're quite diversified. And the same for the other two sectors, the mining and metals and the, the infrastructure. Um, the other thing is those those three sectors behave differently during different uh, parts of the economic cycle. So when the economy is taking off, mining and metals is is booming. Uh, the government doesn't spend as much on infrastructure, roads, bridges, and so on, because most people have jobs when the economy is booming. But when, when the economy starts to go down, government will invest in roads, bridges, water treatment plants to get people working. Uh, so those those sectors offset each other. They're in different cycles, and so overall, you get a pretty stable uh, revenue stream just by virtue of that diversification, both in sectors and then and then geographically and you know with within with different clients. Well, that's why I was also asking about the 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 length of time because you know I did the study on the residential construction industry last time. And, you know, that is definitely up and down, up and down, up and down. But is the, you know, is the, and it's pretty risky, but is the club one that we would want to try to capitalize on something like that? Or is it just inherently too risky um, if, if that, that the length of time we're trying to invest for is, say, 10 years? You know, because, I mean, how? I, mean, I think... Roy has said before, I like how he summarizes, as long as you hold, as long as it makes sense. You cannot yeah. really say that if it's 10 years, it's five years, you know, it could be, you know, uh, two years. We don't know. As long as, like Henny in his presentation say, fundamentally, because we are fundamental investor, right? Mm-hmm. As long as fundamentally management, not deteriorating, right? Keep up. Uh, so that I would not sell. I think if it's a high risk and a very volatile, so for me personally, why do I put the money into that company if I have another very solid, strong growth company? Um, so first question I will ask is, do we have that company, do we have that sector in that company? So I would, if we want to say diversify, I will start looking to ones that we don't have. If the construction is the one that we don't own in that sector, we have nothing in that sector, we will study. If that is a truly very strong one, maybe it's a good buy. I don't remember which sector was um, in the last uh, month when we when you presented. Yeah, um, sector, sector. Anyway, okay. Well, we can. I guess we can take this offline. We'll probably, I don't want to eat up too much time. Yeah. Uh, but, Matt, yeah. the Canadian Solar Company just gave report six days ago. So probably, I don't know if we want to do it in December or if we want to post it, it should give a report. Okay. Well, let me know. Okay. If we have time December, I can do it. 
Okay. Okay. That'd be good. Okay. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions, we'll go on to the annual reports. Quarter reports. Quarterly reports. So I give to who do I give to join first? Because she recommends sell for PSA. Yeah, so go Joanne first. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? Make sure we get her. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I I was trying to tell you guys time, but um, I guess I was muted. But anyway. Oh, we did not. <laughs> you hear. went way oh, You guys went way over. We get it back. Okay. Okay. But n next time, I think we should table. Uh, we should stick to our agenda table things to the end and then have a discussion but we can talk about that later okay i uh my quarterly report is on public storage psa they are storage uh, reit um real estate i think it's a uh, uh industrial a reit industrial they focus on storage units and uh we've held them for quite a while, I think, let's see how long we've held them. A couple of years. I guess uh, we purchased them in 2017. Um, it's not an exciting stock. It's actually got a, a really strong dividend. For me, it doesn't fit into our profile. And actually, at the time we bought, when we this stock was evaluated, we bought both uh, PSA and O, they were both REITs. I don't know why. Why did we sell O? That was yours, Jay, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. You I, remember why we sold yes. O? I probably are documented in the schedule. I have to look. I remember it, they on top of the, all like um, like a FedEx, CVS, Walgreens, or something like that. I forgot what was the reason. I can okay. look. Yeah. Anyway, this actually turned out to be we should have sold this one and not O. I think O is actually doing a lot better in the, really? the REIT category. Mm -hmm. um, so in my stock study, I evaluate, or this quarterly evaluation, You we evaluate REITs on a different uh, criteria than we do on, on other stocks. We, uh, let's see. This is so. This is so. I had to put a, a different evaluation section into the quarterly report called the REIT evaluation. So we look at uh, debt to capital uh, because they use a lot of capital um, debt to finance purchasing of these storage units. And um, we also look at with REITs, they are required to have a dividend distribution. So um, 25, greater than 25 years of consecutive dividends. Um, that's what we, we look for a long history of dividends and um, PSA has that. Let's see. And then their average payout is 75.7%. And then these other two uh, areas, market revenue per available foot, is their um, measurement of how well the the company's doing, the health of the the company, and then the nominal net operating uh, income is also an indicator. So this last quarter, actually, uh, PSA came under the estimate, so it got uh, the stock dropped. The investors responded poorly to that, uh, even though Value Line. And all the industry analysts say they are under excellent management. It's um, this is a tough market. They are renting storage units, and there's a, I think, a surplus of units out there. So the way PSA is competing against its competitors is uh, lowering interest rates. Or I'm sorry, not actually the interest rates are low, so it's to their advantage. But um, they're increasing their rental rates to make up for the, the loss in actual volume of rentals. So when I did my, um, let's see, let's look at the uh, SSG. SSG actually, you know, it's not straight up and 
like Facebook is. I was looking at uh, Jane's um, SSG and her Facebook's amazing. But anyway, uh, this is the PSA. It's fairly slow uh, growth in sales and EPS. Uh, even so, if we look at the valuation and return, it's uh, a buy. But the one significant uh, issue I have with PSA is that the potential price appreciation is very low. So even though it's showing upside down ratio of 4.4, .4, the rate of return is very low. So, and that's um, including the the payout, the dividend. So uh, my recommendation is that is to sell this company because it does not fit into our portfolio of growth companies. Plus, I, yeah, it's just going to continue, I, I believe, to be. I mean, I would recommend this uh, company to anybody that wants a stable company that depends on the dividends, not looking for the growth in stock. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Okay. And um, so I was reading about PSA, and yeah, the, I think the major issue is oversupply of, of self-storage units. So it, it, historically, there's um, there was an undersupply. So people started building more and more of these things. There's two that went up near my house um, and so now there's an oversupply and um, uh, you know the various companies are are cutting prices so to attract customers and so vacancy rates for these storage units have been going up and <clears throat> I would I would say that if the trend continues their dividend might be at risk as well so they may not have enough uh, you know, cash to start to pay the dividend, and once the dividend is cut, um, the stock price is going to go way down. Uh, but if people are buying it for the dividend, then and they cut the dividend, then their stock price is going to take a major hit. So I think long term, it's not a good story. Um, it's going to take a while for this um, oversupply to work itself out. Yeah, um, I. Uh, based on their earnings call, because the market is so fragmented, there's not, I think this company, I think they have less than 20% of the market. It's, there's so many small players in the storage, you know, uh, industry that um, that's one of the things is that they're relying on their brand and their reputation and their, their marketing. They're spending a lot of money marketing. Are they considered a big company or a medium-sized company? Uh, let's see. I mean, according to BI? Yeah. Let's see. If you look at medium. Okay, so um, so a medium-sized company, we would expect to be growing between 7 and 12%. Is that what I remember? Yeah, but this is a different... Because it's a rate. Animal. Yeah, it's but really I don't... Different. I actually think there probably are REITs out there that are growing. It just happens that, I mean, there's REITs that have, um, with healthcare, doctor's offices, I think some of those are growing. Mm. Data centers. Yeah. What, sorry? I said data centers. Oh, data so centers, know. yeah, for REITs. Yeah. yeah, I can't figure out any... <laughs> like any advantage to one of these storage companies uh, versus another people who just want one close to their house. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why did we buy it two years ago? Or... Okay. There's what a, is it? What changed? Too. It, it's not what changed. I think we were trying to get into industries that we hadn't been in before and um, to learn more about how REITs operate because they do operate on it, they don't we don't evaluate them based on EPS we evaluate them on FFO funds from operations so it was a whole we wanted to look at uh, a different type of um, stock investment mm -hmm. okay so experiment 
Yeah. <laughs> so it was the education goal. Yeah, it was the education goal. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Because well, there are there some... Are, there I just are, noticed there there are are some REITs that are very profitable. Yeah, yeah. We just didn't pick I the right think one. Matt and Roy studied. I remember they presented, because I was interested in the med medical uh, facility. Right, Matt, do you remember? You guys studied it, but they're not yeah. come out very strong. If use BI fundamental to evaluate, I don't think they were strong. I was surprised. Right. We yeah. just did it because we were trying to there, there <clears> some fill a sector that we didn't have, I think, or yeah, something. Yeah. But yeah, we kind of just went for it. Cause and I think that's more the education. <laughs> That's the challenge with those sectors that we don't have stocks in, is that it's really hard to find stocks that meet the BI criteria. Bernard, you were trying to say something. Uh, I, yeah, a couple of things. That for one thing, there's new competition in in the storage place, and I see that U-Haul has U-boxes, and so you have a storage that is mobile. So you can have the storage at your house, maybe move it to the place you're moving, leave it there for a month or two, and a very flexible system being presented by U-Haul, they call it the U-Box system. It, it sure looks, I see the ads. It sure looks like that would be competition for storage companies. But also I wanna mention there's, there's, there are websites that specialize in REITs. And if somebody wanted to pick a REIT, they should probably go to one of those websites if you want i could send a, a link or something but that way you could compare and get the right read for the club or for for your own investment so Thank how you. are we doing on time uh let's see 717 so uh, does anybody else want to present a stock uh, well i can I'd like to show a little bit about uh, LAM research. Okay. Should we turn it over to you? Let's see if I can do this. Okay, I'm making you a presenter, Tom. Okay. Okay, so um, this is my uh, stock selection guide for LAM, Re LAM research. Can I guess, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I guess I'll put this in the middle of the screen. So you can see that, you know, sales went, went down from last year to this year and the whole industry sales are down because there was, um, oversupply of uh, memory chips and that seems to be sort of work through and then the people are more enthusiastic about the industry than they were but um, um, you know you, you can see sale, sales and earnings are down but uh, see if I can find this here um, the um, you see the stock prices here I guess they're People are good. It's sort of like the stock price is is ahead of the the fundamentals. Now, like for, for for the whole industry, you know, our earnings are coming down, but uh, the future is looking brighter. So the stocks are being bid up, uh, and you can see that you know Lamb Research is doing uh, as you know better than its competitors at uh, Applied Materials, Tokyo Electronics, and KLA Ten Core, and this is the uh, the NASDAQ, but you know, it's, it's gone up like 96% in the last year. Um, and, uh, so I'm just, um, you know, I guess the, and then I, and I was, I did a pretty aggressive stock selection guide here. I pro projected 9% uh, earnings growth, which is, uh, you know, BI is showing 6.8 and, uh, uh, value line was 8.5 and then I uh, as far as the uh, earnings per share growth I uh, went by the company guidance they say that their uh, pre-tax profit margin would be a, probably be about 25 percent well this is they just gave like short-term guidance their taxes will be 
it said in the low teens, so I picked 13. And then I went with uh, something that's really boosting the earnings per share, is I cut the, the shares back to 140 million. That's what Value Line is projecting because they've been uh, buying shares back pretty aggressively. Now they were they bought they've been buying them back about 190, but the share price is up to about 280 now. So uh, you know I don't think it's such a good buy to to buy their own stock. So um, anyway, if you look at the the valuation, their their current PE is 20.9. The average PE is 14.9. So they're sell it, uh, trading at a pretty high premium to their historical values and you know even I, I went with the um, I guess the historical average PE is pretty much on my uh, stock selection guide I didn't boost those up any but um, it, it you know it's it's coming out to uh, you know only 1.1 to 1 with maybe you know like less than six percent uh, annualized depreciation, uh, you know, at in, for, I think from the current price. Now I don't, you know, I uh, I think it's you know it, it's not way it's not in not in the sell zone at the, at this point, but uh, uh, but it's certainly fully valued. Uh, and the the company did the, the share price did go up. Recently, well, the whole industry's up, but the share price went up after the last earnings report because they released uh, had earnings that were better than expected, and the uh, they gave positive or they increased their guidance. But still, they're only they're they're just guiding for the sales for the industry are going to be uh, probably flat at best over the next year, maybe down a little. So um, that's so I'm uh, not jumping up and down saying saying sell, but uh, there's probably uh, stocks that uh, have better appreciation potential out there someplace. Um, Tom, can you show us what the ratios are? That tab with the so 140 percent. That's really overvalued, right? Well, it's way over the average. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so my question is, why would we hold it and not look for a placement? Why, I don't, see, that was the question we were discussing before, is when to sell. I mean, to me, this Yeah, is, I know, yeah. yeah. Well, but, you, you know, it's like, uh, <clears throat> You, you know, you, you you never know what what's going to happen in the future. You know, they you know you're going to uh, t t trim your flowers and water your weeds. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, but you know, I mean, it's um, it, it's certainly certainly fully valued, and we've made you know I think our uh, we uh, the price has about doubled since we bought it. So um, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, we paid. Uh, it's closed about 283 today, and we paid 143. So that's it's almost a double. But but do you have a replacement that no, I equivalent no, I don't. or better? I, I I don't, and we still have we have uh, almost five thousand dollars cash. And if we sell this, maybe maybe this we got a couple thousand dollars in this. Somewhere, somewhere in that range, we just add to our cash. But if we listen to what Hanny said, mm -hmm. having cash shouldn't be um, why we don't sell. Yeah, or yeah, or why we have yeah. to buy. Yeah. Yeah. We shouldn't be afraid of holding cash. Right. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with that. Also, Hanny, when we looked at the when you were doing your presentation and you said there were certain sectors where we had a small, you know, less percentage than we would like to have in in those different. I don't know if it was a sector or it was an industry. Would you recommend that we buy more of that stock to to give it a higher percentage? 
only only if it's uh, you know if it makes sense only if it's yeah. on sale mm -hmm. and, um, the company is doing well so we you know the, instead of looking at new stock we could certainly do a study and see if it's worth buying those <laughs> Okay. Lem Research is the one that lasts than three percent, right? It's one of them. There are three companies um, less than three percent. Lem Research, we have uh, it's four point four percent. Okay. We've okay. got about nineteen hundred dollars. Our two lowest holdings is uh, BJ's and P, oh, uh, PSA, sorry. and I think we we have Schwab. got a small position in Schwab, Schwab. too. Mm -hmm. mm. And yeah, BJ's. Yeah, didn't BJ's do well last month? Well, yeah, it's it's up. It's up. Um, I I did not see BJ's SSG. Who are we comparing to? BJ's with Cheesecake Factory? I don't, I've never, I don't know what a BJ's is. So well, BJ's it's, a it's restaurant. Burgers and beer. Is it upscale? Low. Middle, uh, middle. Oh, I'd middle. say mid, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fancy, yeah, and then fancy, not fancy. Yeah, small company, it's, small it's, company. No, yeah, it's it, it's not it's not fancy, but it's not fancy. Uh, uh, it's like a cheesecake factory. Wait, wasn't the BJ's um, compared against the Domino's? They are different. Yes. Oh. Well, well, they're they're in they're in the same industry, but I don't think they're uh, hardly direct competitors. And yeah, Domino's is like a pizza, but Domino's has grown as a um, um, franchise. So the BJ's has franchise as well. I'm not sure how franchises work. I'm not sure, but BJ's it's uh, it's I think a BJ's a cheesecake factory should be the direct competitors. I agree. Okay. No, the BJ's is emphasis on beer. What? BJ's what? Bar, uh, Bernard, the BJ's the emphasis is more on, is on quick food, pizza, and beer. Uh, that um, that other big restaurant you're talking about is, is a fancy dump, fancy place. BJ's Which, is just straight beer and beer and, and pizza. It's a very simple restaurant. They have one in Arden Mall. You can look it over. Yeah, we have one in my neighborhood too. I okay, we're getting there. we're getting off track, guys. Okay. Um, yeah. So what what is the point of this? Well, we're I'm thinking about adding to the adding to the positions of uh, companies. The smaller that holdings. We, yeah. Our smaller yeah. holdings. Yeah. So I would, you know, I think we should look at BJ's and see if if it's overvalued, uh, if it's gone up quite a bit, then maybe. Uh, do we want to hold it? Does it have long-term potential? I don't think we did a very detailed stock study, or if, if it if it was done, we didn't present it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we did an SSG. Or again, if if we did, it wasn't presented. So if we're going to look at adding to it, we should probably just re-examine a lot. I agree. Yes. Okay. okay. Well, we can, we can. Uh, um, which I don't we don't need to make a decision on lamb here t tonight but I just wanted was wanting to point out that uh, I think it at, from this point I think it's got limited upside in the short term so Tom for our stock study we can look at lamb or look at the restaurants Tom are you suggesting are we taking a profit for lamb research based yeah. on what you presented Took just um, make a profit, right? I'm, I can, considering it. Yeah, because the future growth potential is low. It's like mine. PSA is not going to get us. Yeah. Is that what that company said? The future growth. I know you showed the SSG, but what? I, I I don't remember well, what this, you this know is. this is kind of a kind of a funny industry you know I mean like it's 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 weird you know like when when their sa when their sales were going up like last last year 2018 was a huge mm -hmm. year for mm. that in industry um, and they were 
companies were buying a lot of equipment and they were selling a lot of chips. They, like there was oversupply and people could see that. So the companies, those um, the equipment companies were doing really well, but people could see like the future was not going to be so good. And mm. so the, they bid, the, they, the share price went down. And so now they think the future is going to be better. So they bid the share price up. And it's like the, the earnings, uh, the expectations are leading the stock price. It isn't like the, 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 the share price is following the earnings. It's kind of the, it's, it's kind of the opposite. What well, do you think, like in your, in your documentation, you said the 5G smartphone launch will increase chip demand in 2020 and beyond. Do you think it will have impact to their sales, to their growth, basically? Well, may, maybe to an extent, you know, not, not uh, you know, if, if there's more, more cell phones sold, or more more devices sold, there there's going to be more uh, uh, more more RAM and more f flash memory uh, required to to build those devices, and their equipment is used to build the, those chips. So, you know, long term, um, you know, there's probably going to be more demand. But you know, I don't think it's you know, like, um, I don't know if it's probably just going to be inc incremental, you know, I mean, if people have, uh, I don't know how many new, new new cell phones are going to be sold because of, of 5G. Or, 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 you know, I don't, oh. well, people replace their cell phone every three everything. to five years, right? Every three years to replace their cell phone? Between right there's five. there's a you know, there, there's a constant demand from from replacement and I don't know I guess if we get more to this internet of things or uh, uh, if that's the right word for it I can't remember <laughs> it is internet of things uh, but you know there's uh, there's probably yeah. going to be more uh, computer uh, more chips sold as there get to be more and more um, electronic devices. You know, I don't know how how much that uh, the market is going to grow. It, it it won't shrink. This morning, I heard a news yeah. that uh, Huawei is not going to use Huawei is not going because they have a company in USA, and because you United States did not want to use their the Huawei cell phone, right? Because security reasons, and Huawei is saying that they are not going to use a. Um, American-made chips, they will use their own. I don't know from China or Korea. I'm not sure, but okay, not well, US-made chips. Now, LAM, all these semiconduct, these equipment companies like LAM Research and Applied Materials, most of the chip companies are overseas. They're in J Japan, China, Korea. And these Taiwan, companies, yeah. And Taiwan, they sell this equipment to the companies in those countries and then the chips are, are made in Korea or they're made in China or they're made in Japan so they can just buy those it, it isn't like um, you know they're buying American chips they're buying chips that are made elsewhere you know like mm -hmm. in the case of Huawei yeah or, or any of these, you know, you probably it's probably hard to buy in I American don't know why chip. I feel like this company I would just listen to my Part try to understand about this industry. Um, they are making I forgot was making something to make the chips, right? They m produce right. equipments to make the chips. Right. I don't know why I feel like they have future. I don't know. It's... Well, well, the, you know they're making more. You know there's there's the demand for chips and yeah. the chips are getting more, yeah. more and more more and more complex they're, they're getting more mm. more and more circuits more and more label uh, layers and they've got over a hundred layers on these chips now if you, if you can mm. believe that those things are so so tiny and then they've got a hundred little la layers on one on top of the other it's, uh, do you so how long have we hold I have company? a fine material Two, that's going up have, really good too I, I I think about a year. 2018, November 2018, exactly a year. I think we are still well. We made a well. How much percentage right now? We made a. Oh, but it's about doubled. 
doubled. We have a hold. I feel maybe hold a little bit longer for another quarter just to see. Okay. I guess, yeah, we bought it. Or, a, or maybe longer. A, a year ago tomorrow. Yes, we bought a well, year we ago. Can, we, can, we can hold for now and reevaluate re uh, in three yeah. months. Right, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Should we, okay. are there any motions? Uh, I, I move we uh, sell I move PSA. that we sell PSA. I second. Okay, I second. So, okay, so uh, Hanny had us all log on to our uh, my iClubs. Do you want Do you want to just uh, give me the screen? Uh, yes, I can. Joanne or Jay, and I'll show yep. you. Okay. I don't remember what I thought I had my iClub up here someplace. Oh, wait a minute. I... Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is uh, my iClub home. We're going to go to voting over here. Mm -hmm. And we're going to add a new motion mm. and uh, sell. Oops, I have my caps on. Apologies. Cell PSA. And um, motion made by Bernard. Who's second? Tom. I did. Tom. Mm -hmm. And uh, keep voting till majority is reached or simple majority. Simple majority. And. Notify no, my, members. My, my screen says you don't have any current motions. Yeah, he's quitting right now. No, because I haven't. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. He's right now uh, working on showing us. Oops, my my computer went blank. Sorry. It does that every once in a while. So I'm going to do save motion and notify members. Okay. Okay. So now we can vote. And um, then it says motion 21 by Bernard Scoville, seconded by Tom Jones. And okay. then I'm going to say yes here and yeah. vote. Okay. And then current motions. I already voted. See who has not yet voted. Oh, Roy is not here. Joanne. How come Jane. I my, uh, mine isn't sh showing up? Done. What's not showing up? It under current motions is you don't have any current motions in your club. Refresh our screen. Okay. It's already, it's already gone. It's already gone. It, it passed seven seven yeses. Majority. Super majority. So it's not going to be there. Anymore. Oh really? Oh, well, it's already so when there's a majority, yeah. it just closes it down. Okay. No, but yeah. he set up as a simple vote though. He did not say he's a majority. Right? It says, it's, it says it's passed and it's closed. Oh. You, can see, you can see it in archive. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A simple majority okay. requires to pass. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I see. I got gotcha. you. Okay. Okay. Right. Has Roy resigned from the club? No. Not yet. He's no. just a, I think he's like an observer. Okay. Because I don't think he's he's not watching any stocks. Well, um, do we do we want do we want to allow that status of of member? Probably not. We want active participants. That, he can he can fine. be a, he can be a he can be a guest. Well, yeah, he, he can be a guest. Don't we need a? Uh, don't we get iClub through him? Yes, but we are going to be a model club, so we will get it anyway. But, but that's my feeling. If if we have all the, everybody should pull their weight. Yeah, I agree. Well, Roy was watching Skyworks. He was. Well, I, Tom is I watching. Somebody's going to be watching. Okay. 
And also now Jane doesn't have a stock since oh, um, yeah. PSAs. It's available. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she's available for <laughs> So what are the two stocks there for? I can give her one. I have two. Where... I have two. I think yeah. I have two. Do you want to give her Fleet Corps? We can do Fleet Corps for her. Oh. Um, do we want to uh, take this offline and sure. then okay. want to yeah. end the on? meeting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. You can okay. close the meeting and then okay. adjourn well, it. So, so sorry, where do I close it? Oh, I will stop, no other re emotions, stop recording. I guess, first, right? I'm going to stop recording. Wait, oh wait, hold hold on. What did you say, Matt? No other emotions? Well, did anybody else have any other emotions? I don't know. I just did the one. I don't personally, but I don't. Okay. All right. We will look at the Facebook we'll and, the, and uh, Comcast next month.